Remote viewing is a perceptual technique whereby a person can describe places, events, or people that are perceived mentally but separated mm -hmm. from the viewer by distance, shielding, and even time. Mm -hmm. It's, if you like, it's a, a trained intuitive ability, intuitive ability. How is remote viewing used, um, used today? I've been tasked to uh, help locate murderers and to unravel clues that may help towards finding who the murderer may be in a particular case. Uh, within businesses, helping with negotiations, investigations, uh, lost property, uh, insurance scams, uh, missing persons. Yeah. There's, a, there's quite a long list that I've been involved with all of those. And does your work involve um, sitting in a dark room, say in a police station or something, and um, sort of conjuring up the image of, of the crime scene? No, I sit at home with a cup of coffee yeah. at a table, usually cleared of objects that you know, might get in the way and I just um, focus in on what's called a coordinate, something which is going to help me to find what's called the signal line. Yeah. And then from then, uh, small images appear, a bit like uh, bits of a jigsaw, mm -hmm. and eventually we draw up information from that. Some of it's sensory, some of it um, uh, is uh, visual, mm -hmm. some of it is impressions, uh, emotional impressions, and basically feelings that are around the actual site itself and eventually we can come up with enough information that will help to solve the problem or tell us what's actually at that particular site. Let's now shift our attention to the next big question, which is, how was the Great Pyramid of Giza actually constructed? This moves us to the second target in the series. Beginning alphabetically, again with Dick Algar's work, he did two sessions for this target. The first half of the first session is filled with many perceptions of repetitive mechanical processes working with rock. Great energy is involved in melting rock, as in artificial volcanism. There is mining on a large scale. Energy is used to cut rock, much in the manner that welding is done with metal, producing liquefied rock. The viewer explicitly describes what looks like high-tech alien mining. This description is accompanied by clear drawings of energy tools being used that focus energy on rock. The rock is both liquefied and vaporized, involving great heat and pressure, thereby separating the rock. There are also many life forms working on all of this. They have a hive mentality, working in large numbers underground. They feel like drones, and he describes them as not too smart. In Dick's second session for this target, he perceives drone-like humanoids who are genetically engineered to work under extremely harsh and polluting environments involving high-tech processes used for constructing large rock structures. The environment is like a foundry with toxic air quality. Everything is high-tech. Energy is used to melt rather than blast rock. Construction is on a massive scale and large underground tunnel complexes are involved. The workers seem to be grown from fetuses in artificial environments by beings whom the viewer perceives as praying mantis in nature. Watch and listen to Dick Algeyer describe all of this with this session recorded live on video. This is inside. This is, um, this is more earthy. This is very dense right here. This is very enclosed, confining, claustrophobic. Well, it's uh, it's big but claustrophobic at the same time. So it's a big cavernous place, but it's dim, it's dark, it's claustrophobic because you feel like deep underground. There's a almost how can I draw this? Like a tunnel. Okay, so you're going in this. Okay, and these guys. Go in here. The sense of descending. This really feels like miners going into a mine, but they're not like miners. 
Like if you were miners going into the coal mine, you'd be carrying your lunch bucket. You'd be joking with your friends about the, the you know, what your girlfriend did last night and what you're going to do after work. You're going to go look at the game. None of that. There's none of that. These guys are just, and they're all the same size. They're like little clones of each other, clones. And uh, genetically mo manipulated, genetic modification and uh, worker bees. Okay, so they, they're going down. It's a confining place, but it's, it's big. There's like a big ceiling. And this is an environment that is really nasty, hot, gritty, uh, acrid, bad smoke. If I was there, I would choke to death in, a, in an instant. And uh, there's a glow down in here. Like molten something like very uh, like in a steel foundry they have a slag heap that the molten stuff is there it's sizzling and steaming and emitting noxious gases this is a very unhealthy place this is the bad environment and they're bred to be here um, they can handle it, but only for a little while because they, uh, it's like they've got a, a part of their DNA that allows them to slough off or absorb or somehow be in this environment and it, they don't, deg they degrade, but not as fast there's a degradation so after a while they become useless so they do they're they're programmed and they come here and it feels like mining or terra terraforming uh, building something deep underground that is and it might involve mining tunneling with fusing rock uh, melting it literally and there's just evil gases here, but they, they can handle it, but only for a little while. And so it's not that they wear out, they, they just get defective. They will instead, of, they'll just walk into the molten stuff, get close enough to it that they cease to function. And so it, the people in charge, it bothered them how can we make them survive this longer? But ultimately, they don't care because they can just make a new crop. They can just um, get rid of these and viscous, viscous. Oh, I can't spell when I'm remotely viscous. Viscous? How do you spell that? Viscous. Thick. It's a greenish, it's a thick fluid. These are fetuses. There's a room full of these, man. Okay. These are the, they don't, it's like they don't have souls. They're just grown in a solution to be genetically engineered robots. And if they have a soul, it's a very primitive soul, like the, um, just enough to animate it, but not enough to give it aspirations and the, uh, humanity. It, it would be like a way lower life form. Looks like Elephant Man. It's not Elephant Man. This is Praying Manus Lady. Okay. Did I say that? This is not... These are eyes. This is not Elephant Man. This is Praying Manus Lady. And she's actually has, has a, a kind of a 
for how spooky looking this is, has a, a nurturing feel, like uh, like a female, um, almost motherly kind of feel. Um, not a startling, but not frightening. To her, we look like um, guppies. We're not scary, we're just different. Um, very intelligent, but uh, caring on a certain, in a certain way. Um, Business-like, but a nice, you know, it's, it's I gotta deal with this for a minute. Hang on. <laughs> this is uh, just very nicely, like uh, um, how entertaining that you'd be looking at this. But uh, move along; it's not your it's not your business. One of them was this idea. Was there like this um, drone race of aliens involved? Is that is that your interpretation of it? And then if drone they broke race. down, they well, during the during the construct during the mining process, there were clones, right? Short that's... clones that were used, um, and they were genetically engineered by this group of aliens that Dick Algar called praying mantis. Uh, this at least there was a praying mantis lady that he drew and. She was sort of a weird nurturing type of personality, but in an odd way, because her, her, her task was to grow these fetuses. So you might call those drones, but um, I don't know if you'd call them extraterrestrials or just human weird type creatures. And at the end, they were kind of just melted or something? Is that like when they just broken? became defective and broken and just sort of discarded? That's they. You don't think of them as dying. You think of if I'm from the extraterrestrial point of view, you think of them as just no longer working, no mm -hmm. longer no longer operating and becoming defective, and then off they go. And then you have to, to replace them with a new crop. All of these being cloned from Cl okay, one clone? specific species up there at the yeah. top level. Yeah. I, uh... I don't think that the insectolins, uh, insect-like ones are cloned. I don't think the reptilian ones are cloned. I do, however, think that it is highly possible that gray aliens are cloned. Number one, they have no sexual apparatus. Therefore, it's really tough to recreate themselves. Number two, and this has always bothered me, I, I take a look at their eyes. Okay, I can, I'll deal with that. That's fine. Then I take a look at their ears, got to have ears, they got little holes in the sides of their heads because if something falls, they got to be able to look over and see what that was. Survival feature. Uh, on those, okay. A mouth, no. It always bothered me. Why do these gray aliens have a mouth? They do not breathe. They do not open their mouths. Some abductees have said they have. I think it's confabulation. Uh, they don't have any teeth, and they don't eat through their mouths. They eat through skin absorption. Why do they have a mouth? And then I realized that these beings probably have this little bit of human DNA in them, which would cause them to have that mouth and the bodily shape. Um, but how are they born? Since we don't see baby... Uh, uh, aliens. But then again, we don't know the backstory of a lot of these things. We don't know what's happening in the back of, uh, you know, when they're, 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 they're producing hybrids and, uh, I mean, uh, gray aliens in one way or another. We don't, we don't have any knowledge of that at all. But it is possible that they could be clones. Now, are they going to be clones back to babyhood and then grow? Or is there a different way of cloning that might be almost like stamping them out of a die. Because we don't really see age on them. 
And the answer is, I, I don't know. But Sims might be right in that some of these beings might be cloned. But we really don't know. Now, we can clone things because it's all brand new and it's super hot. And oh, my goodness. And oh, my gracious. A hundred years from now, we'll look at that and laugh. So, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at, at, at technology that is more advanced on all levels. That's the thing. Now, that brings me back to reptilians. Reptilians, uh, 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 in my, this is guess, I'm guessing. Insect-like ones, by and large, do not come and abduct people. Gray aliens do and hybrids do. That's what I've been hearing over and over and over and over and over and over again. When they get on board, they might see a, an insect-like one, you know, watching the proceedings or, or, or doing something else or whatever it is. There had to be a time when there was no abduction phenomenon. When uh, there was nobody visiting Earth for any reason. When this group came here, they had to say to themselves or to somebody else, maybe a higher up somewhere, this is the one, we'll take this one, meaning Earth. Now, if this is going to be yet another program of hybridization, take over through hybridization, then uh, they, and if the if the insect-like ones who are the head guys don't go down and get people, they had to bring a workforce with them. Those were the reptilians. They were the first ones to go down and start getting people, I think, because the insect-like ones don't do that. And... Uh, when people see them now, once they got enough people, they began to take eggs and, and this and that, and they got the gray aliens. That's my guess. And they're still getting them. They have to have more and more and more and more and more and more gray aliens because of the population explosion uh, uh, in, in the Earth. So uh, the reptilians, people hate. They are re reported every once in a while. Every once in a while, the abductees will report them. I'll, I'll do 20 sessions with an abductee, and then on that 21st, they'll say, this guy is really weird looking. It looks like, a, you know, oh, man, keep him away from me. I don't like him. Ooh, uh, uh. And then they say, I might have seen this guy before, too. Oh, God, he's horrible. Take him away from me. Then get him away. He's terrible. He's terrible. He's, yeah, I, I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. And I'll say, my God, what, well, is he hurting you? Is he, is he, is he, you know, is he harming you in some way? No, no, I, I just hate him. Well, is, is, is he threatening you in some way? No, no, I just, just get him away from me. I hate him. I hate him. He gives off the aura of threat. When he begins to deal with the abductee, he does the same procedures as the gray aliens do. So it's, it's, a. Uh, uh, he's just a worker. He's a worker, like the rest of them. But my guess is they are real aliens also, as opposed to clones or hybrids that the, the gray aliens might be or all the other hybrids. Uh, I think uh, that they were the original workforce. Uh, I may be wrong about that. This is pure speculation. But they had to have a group who first came down and got people, and my guess was it wasn't the gray aliens with their mouths, it was the reptilians. That's, that's my sense of it. That is pure speculation. I do not have evidence for it. It's just logic for me. So let's back up. And so I think my listeners, for the most part, have heard of grays. Um, you know, maybe they've heard of like, the reptilians or, you know, they're the praying mantis guys, but maybe you can kind of give a rundown of the beings that have been presented to you by the um, abductees. Right. Uh, um, 
in my first book, Secret Life, I did sort of a, a rundown on, on different beings, and I did the same thing, only in much greater detail, in my second book on abduction. It's called The Threat. And um, this book, though, goes even further into, into it. And, wh and what I think I'm looking at is not so much different types as a, a smooth spectrum of change, um, hybridization, so to speak. The ones who are in charge are the insect looking ones who I call insectolins. Uh, they, 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 people say they look like praying mantises. That's the most used word for them. And that's probably fairly close to accurate. Uh, they are the brains behind the outfit, I think. Um, this is speculation, but, but there's evidence for it. Uh, they call the shots and they know what they're doing. Uh, then comes uh, a gray aliens who I think were originally, and I'm guessing at this, clones, I'm sorry, uh, um, created with human DNA and alien DNA of some sort. And then eventually, once the initial group was done, that either either the, uh, uh, the, the hybridization continued or they were cloned. Uh, since I, that book has come out, I've, I'm leaning more and more to being clones because they all look alike, essentially. It's very difficult to tell one from the other. Um, there are taller ones and there are smaller ones. They all have jobs to do. They all have tasks. And that's all they do and all they think about, most of them, anyway. Then you begin to get the standard hybrids, beings who look really alien, but they have a little bit of whites in their eyes, they have a tiny little mouth, they have a little tiny nose, they have a pointed chin, they have uh, very large eyes with black, you know, black eyes, but with these little whites in them, uh, and, uh, and very, very thin hair. Then they, uh, uh, they, there's a, sort of this progression to ones who were sort of uh, look half halfway between human and alien, then they eventually get to ones who look quite human, only with enough differences to make them odd a little bit. And then eventually you get to uh, ones who are really looking human, but but their brains don't work in the way in which ours do. For example, a security hybrid who only thinks about security of, of other hybrids and of uh, abductees not saying anything about what they're doing. And there's nothing else in a person in that that being's brain other than the security. And eventually you get what's called a personal project hybrid, which I talked about in the threat, who's been with a, a woman oftentimes um, uh, since she was a child and continues to, to, to monitor her. And, um, and what I call hubrids are, are sort of the last one. Hubrids are human, period. Everything about them is human and average. They all look average, they look normal, they look just like anybody else. They're five foot nine approximately. Uh, they're between the ages usually of 17 and about 24. And um, there's only one slight, slight, barely noticeable difference. And the difference is they can control humans totally and completely, and we cannot control them. They can make humans think whatever they want them to think. They can make them do whatever they want them to do. They can make them forget whatever they want them to forget, and so on and so forth. Uh, that difference makes hubrids a different species, and it makes us a second-class species, because we cannot do that, unfortunately. And, uh, and this is how you control people. You control people eventually one by one, but eventually you can have a whole heck of a lot of these hubrids moving into society, uh, controlling an awful lot of, uh, of uh, people, just regular people. The problem here is that these hybrids or hubrids, as I call the ones we're moving in, um, have absolute loyalty to the insect-like ones. It is the insect-like ones we have to worry about. <laughs> it's not so much the hubrids. Uh, they're worrisome, of course, because they can do whatever they want with us. But um, but the, the the leader of the pack, so to speak, is the insect-like ones. They do not tell the hybrids why they're doing things. As as one hybrid said, my my task is to live here. And and that's all he knows. That's all he knew was that that was what he was supposed to do.
how, how do abductees describe their abductors physically and, and in terms of behavior and, and so forth? People have often said to me, you know, well, what do they look like? Well, what do these beings look like? Well, actually, it's, in my opinion, there are four basic types. But arriving at the idea that there are four basic types is, uh, has been difficult because uh, people will say things that are not true. And, and part of the memory recovery process hey, gives people a kind of, there, there's a, 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 almost a built-in distortion into it that happens very frequently during the first second and to a lesser degree third sessions uh, and 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 most people who do hypnosis only do one or two or three sessions and most hypnotists only do one session so you get a maximum amount of distortion and confabulation in original in, in, in first sessions and it's during that time that people will will describe aliens in any number of ways and uh, so we get a huge variety of sort of raw cases of any of all sorts of descriptions of aliens, uh, tall ones and fat ones and blue ones and, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, actually, when confabulation is controlled for, when in fact uh, the hypnotist, if, if the person knows what he or she is doing, understands what, and understands what they're listening to and can give the abductee a chance to re-describe later on in different contexts and so forth. Uh, and as hypnosis goes on with different sessions over a longer period of time, uh, 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 these accounts and descriptions tend to regularize into essentially four different groups. And that's important to understand because people have come forward and said there's 137 different kinds and, and uh, 246 different kinds. This was a statement made in a conference once. My name's Clifford Stone. I was a Sergeant First Class, United States Army. When I got out in 1989, we had cataloged 57 different species. Uh, you have individuals that look very much like you and myself that could walk among, among us and you wouldn't even notice the difference, except for some of the things that uh, they might be able to go ahead, even in a dark room, and touch an object and go, go ahead and identify what color that object might be. They would have a heightened sense of smell, sight, uh, hearing. Uh, the uh, situation is that you have various types of what we normally call grays. We didn't call them grays in the military, but you had at least three types of the grays. You had some that were much taller than we were. Uh, the unique thing I th uh, that I'd like to point out for the most part is that the entities that we did catalog were in fact humanoid. Now this created a situation where the scientific community was trying to figure out why that would be the case. And then there are ones who people have for years called Nordics. These are tall ones or blonde or whatever. Uh, these are, in my opinion, uh, adult hybrids. And in fact, I have uh, at no time in 13 years investigated cases of these where these did not turn out to be adult hybrids. Uh, and uh, there, for, for me, there is no evidence of anything but that. These are adult hybrids. The mantids, the praying mantis beings, seem to be the overlords of the greys. And I heard a very interesting theory from an Air Force officer uh, that some people in the, in the Air Force intelligence believe that what we call the greys are really hybrid creatures that are crosses between mantids and humans. Oh. Cross mantid with a human and you get a little gray extraterrestrial. Well, that would lend some credence to the ongoing stories about uh, alien-human hybridization projects that have been g going on for probably the last 50 years. Sure, so, I know... I know a person exactly like that. She reported this to me. She lives in the Midwest, and she's been abducted regularly since she was seven years old when she, her grandmother, and her mother, uh, no, she, her grandmother, and her grandfather were in a car, and a UFO swooped down and started following them, and the grandfather and the grandmother noticed it, and then all of a sudden they heard something like a beep, and blanked out, and then when they woke up, she woke up, the young girl, 
she looked at grandma and grandpa and they were just driving straight ahead and not saying a word and didn't want to talk anything about it, never mentioned it. But then there were regular visitations to the house, to the grandma and to the granddaughter. Now you have to understand that the way it works is the abduction phenomenon is intergenerational. So if an abductee marries a non-abductee, and most, I'd say 95% of abductees do not know that they're abductees, although they know they led odd lives, but they think that's the way life is led. But um, uh, when they get married and they have two kids, those two kids will be abductees. When those two kids get married and they have two kids, those four kids will be abductees. So you get a spreading out in the society as the population increases. When that happens, you need more and more gray aliens to process abductees as the population increases. And that's why I'm becoming more and more um, uh, used to thinking of uh, the gray aliens as being cloned as opposed to just being uh, hybrid hybridized. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, you have this then you have this vast, vast program uh, just in the United States and of course it's worldwide uh, uh, of, of and continuation of making abductees on earth and processing them on on board UFOs and and it's the good, the bad, the ugly. It's everybody and, and it's anybody. I've worked with people who have PhDs and MDs and LLDs and, and scientists and engineers and on and on and on and on attorneys, and uh, all of whom know that by coming to me, they are in essence outing themselves to a stranger. And they know that if anybody knew that they thought that they were being abducted by aliens from another planet or from outer space, this would not be the best thing that could happen to them in their careers. You know what I mean? Particularly psychiatrists and psychologists. That's all I got to say. I'm, I've been abducted by aliens. I just don't think that, that their clientele would beat a path to their doors. Uh, and so, uh, so but, but they need to know what has been going on throughout the course of their lives. It starts in infancy or, or early childhood. It goes all the way up into old age. It stops somewhere in old age, maybe at around age 80, maybe 75. I'm not sure. But we don't see uh, really old abductees, and we should. Um, it's and but it, it's something that is it, it's an assembly line situation, and every aspect of it has been planned out. This is not just a catch as catch can situation. This has all been thought through. We are being invaded right now, uh, and they are taking children as well as adults. Mencken, a brilliant technical writer who's worked for Boeing and NASA, has spent much of his life gathering evidence of alien abductions. Among the most disturbing, dozens of drawings by a young Texas girl named Ariel. This is Ariel. Here's an alien. Here's an alien baby. Now we have a, a drawing of uh, aliens coming to get her as she, as she actually sees them landing. I remember this light, um, it was in the sky, but... Nine-year-old Ariel first began drawing aliens five years ago. They're like this with these wide eyes, like that. They have really small noses and mouths, but they don't talk. They didn't talk? Yeah, they talk through their mind. Here, it's Ariel has tried to illustrate this telepathic communication. She has also drawn pictures of herself strapped down on an examination table. Aliens coming for her brother and herself playing with little alien babies. What did her mother think of these drawings? I felt afraid. I felt... I feel like this is more real to me now than ever. More real because Joni says That's she, too, she has been has frequently abducted me. by aliens. So this may sound crazy, but I also have memories of having a baby and having this baby removed from me, being taken more than once. I'm sorry.
one little boy made this drawing, uh, which I find very touching. He remembered being taken into a ship, and he saw a little boy who he knew in the neighborhood on this table. And notice the table is a solid block, as it's often described in abduction cases. And the alien figure, uh, you see, has one huge eye because the child was trying to do a profile. So he puts a big frontal eye and a profile head, which is something the Egyptians never got out of. <laughs> uh, but what's happening is the uh, doctor alien type is putting uh, some kind of a needle into this corner of this child's eye. And this little boy witnessed this and was terrified for months after about his own eye as if something was going to happen to him. But the drawings are, I think, wonderful illustrations of what children think about when they have these experiences. It isn't very pleasant. Now, another area of evidence um, that has to do with things that happen to children is that very often little children uh, we believe, although the evidence isn't nearly as strong here on, as in other areas, but we believe uh, they have uh, often implants put into their bodies. And t I'll tell you the, the story of this particular event. Um, this is uh, a five-year-old child whose uh, father was in the army in Europe. And uh, this little girl and her parents went on a vacation to Italy and while they were in Italy she had some kind of an accident on her bicycle or something and uh, hit her head and they were afraid that she might have fractured her skull and she was taken to the hospital and the x-rays of which this is one turned up uh, a strange object it's on the left side in the eye socket I'll have to point it out here That object, uh, a metallic squarish object, uh, turned up on the x-ray now. Uh, another x-ray was done. The first was done looking up from under the ch child's chin and the next was taken from down at a very steep angle at the top of the head as you can see. Uh, you can get a sense three-dimensionally where the object is and in this uh, profile shot, you can see it very clearly. This little girl, um, the doctor came out and uh, I have a radiological report in Italian that describes this object. Um, the doctors didn't know what it was and of course it's the kind of thing that couldn't be in the child's head through an accident without a mark being left and it was in a very dangerous place. Uh, but when the child was taken back to Germany, and the child of course did not have a skull fracture and was okay, uh, the father decided to take the child into a military hospital for another set of x-rays and they did and there was nothing there. And as in many cases, uh, it seems that uh, it's as if the aliens are aware when an x-ray is taken and they remove the thing somehow. How it gets, goes in and goes out, we don't know. But all of these things are kind of outward manifestations of the physical problems that the child is being subjected to, is undergoing. I mean, another huge category of uh, alien investigation or just a whole another part of it is something uh, like implants. Do, do you talk to many people who have experienced implants or have implants or think they have implants or took out yeah, some that, implants? Yeah, that's, 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 yeah, I would say, I used to be, I used to say, well, 50%, I think 50% of abductees have uh, implants, but they probably all have an implant somewhere. Right. Uh, the, the, the main areas to place an implant is, um, uh, through the uh, nasal passage, uh, up through the uh, cartilage, and uh, probably deposited uh, near the pituitary glands. And what are they what, for? Uh, well, uh, they're stuck in people's ears through the eardrum near the uh, brain. They're stuck the, uh, at the end of the eye into uh, on, uh, a, uh, a nasal cavity uh, 
We do not know what they're for. We know nothing, zero, about any technology that they have on board. They never say anything, and abductees therefore don't know. We do right, not right. know what they are for. People guess, they say, well, they're a tracking device. And the answer is, yeah, right, a tracking device. Um, as if this were 19, you know, we're now or something like that. My best guess, and this is a simple guess, is that they are an extremely multifunction uh, uh, item that describes uh, who the person is, what procedures have already done, been done to him or her, what needs to be done, like a medical records type thing, plus a number of other things, measuring levels of hormones, who knows, but um, but it's, it's actually quite common to have these. Now, there was a guy named Roger Lear from L.A., uh, uh, who was a podiatrist who got interested in abduction events, and he put together a team of researchers because podiatrists are only allowed to do uh, medicine, basically. Um, uh, they can't do operations but, uh, except below the knee. And uh, uh, taking out an implant from somebody would be considered an operation. So he got a team of doctors together, and they removed a whole bunch of different implants not usually found in the places that I just mentioned. On the bottom of a guy's foot, uh, on somebody's hand, on somebody's uh, arm or leg or whatever. And uh, a lot of them were, weren't very interesting, but some of them actually were quite interesting. And, and, uh, and, and uh, he, he, he wrote about them and, and uh, they, they seemed to move by themselves. If you put metal near them, they would move off to the side like a, uh, in, in some way, and it wasn't magnetic. Um, but it, it, knowing what they what they do, it's just it's not going to be possible. It's just not going to be possible. We are not advanced enough. Uh, uh, we we don't have enough learning levels of knowledge to understand what this gizmo would do, even if we knew absolutely positively that it was uh, an, an implant. Right. The, right. the problem is most people just don't want their head cracked open to retrieve, to scoop out an implant near their pituitary gland. For women, almost every one of the abductees that are female undergo gynecological procedures of various sorts, sometimes painful, sometimes not. But the result and the after effects are that many, many, many abductees much higher than the national average suffer from extremely severe gynecological problems after being used by the aliens in these procedures. In fact, we have a report very recently of a 10-year-old girl who just had to have a hysterectomy because of what they had done with her. It's getting younger and younger. There are also many implantations performed on abductees. You've heard about the little BB probes that are put up the nose and go penetrate into here like my husband had when he and his best friend were abducted when they were 12. As often, or maybe even more often, they use behind the eye, as you heard with Barbara's presentation today, they take the eye out, they do the implant behind it, put the eye back in. They also put them in through the ear. Most recently, they've begun putting them behind the ear into the base of the brain. And very often, they go into the spine at some point ranging from the base of the neck all the way down to the bottom of the spine. All right, what does this have to do with crossbreeding or spiritual elevation, you might wonder, as I do. Many re abductees report the brain surgery, like, like Beth, when they opened her head and took out her brain. This report is as common as the sperm and ova taking, although you don't hear about it as often. And people who have this happen use almost the same phrase, they opened my head and took out my brain. Word for word, I can repeat it on tape after tape, the same scenario. Certain kinds of instruments are repeatedly reported as part of these procedures. You know about the little light bar or light wand that's used to scan over the body. This is very, very common. A long needle device, sometimes into the brain, sometimes into the abdomen, sometimes into other areas, even into between the toes, is reported repeatedly. And then, of course, there's the infamous alien dentist chair. How many of you have been in that? You're in the chair, the equipment pulls down from overhead, and you get the little 
oh, laser type or razor type or probe type device that is used in any number of areas on the body. These are very similar from report to report to report. Abductees are very frequently given an unknown liquid to drink. No explanation for what this is about. Sometimes they're given a substance to swallow or to eat with no explanation of what it is. And the results of these liquids and these pills or substances are varying. Sometimes it's dizziness, loss of consciousness, extreme nausea, and sexual stimulation. All of these are frequently reported from these substances we are made to ingest. Uh, often there's an immersion into a pool of liquid that the abductee is forced to inhale, thinking they're going to drown, but they find they can breathe this liquid. Very often they present scenarios or visions of past events in the person's lives or future events on the global scale. They'll show uh, futuristic war scenes or the planet blowing up or the moon exploding or terrible floods or earthquakes or chaos as a future event. And this is used as part of the programming. And they often tell us, you're going to have a job to do when this happens. And finally, there is the great variety of sexual activity that is perpetrated upon abductees. And I'm talking almost every variety of the sex act that you can imagine with aliens, with things we don't even know what they are, and with, from, with abductees among abductees. They may take an abductee from one place and an abductee from another and force them into sexual activity together. They don't know each other. They don't know if that person has AIDS. They don't know what the condition is, but they are forced into sexual activity, and this is repeatedly done. In fact, in one case of here that's so heartbreaking, Lisa, the woman in Alabama, uh, last year was abducted, and there was another man, another abductee, that she was forced to engage in a sexual act with, and the man apologized to her very, very deeply. He said, I'm sorry, they make me do this. They've been taking me since I was a child. I can't help it, I'm sorry. And again, this is reported in many different instances. And I'm not just talking about genital intercourse. I'm talking about a variety of sexual acts. And I'm talking about on people as old as in their 70s and on children as young as three years old. In fact, one, one abductee adult mother of two children who was fairly happy with her sexual activity to a certain point, well, she said it's some of the best sex she ever had, was not at all disturbed that she was repeatedly being forced into these sexual encounters until one morning she gets up and her five-year-old daughter is sexually manipulating the three-year-old daughter. And aghast, she says, what are you doing? She says, mommy, we're just doing what the little doctors do to us when they come in the bedroom at night. Mm. Are they crossbreeding? Are they taking ova from three-year-old children? I have a problem with this. 